Take your Bible, please, if you will, and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 once again, passage that we've already read together. And while you're turning there, just a reminder, Paul started this church in this uh, city of Thessalonica. He started the church, and now he is in the city of Corinth, and he is writing them a letter. And in writing this letter to them, he is reminiscing of the months that he spent there ministering among them. And in doing so, he says, you know, my ministry among you, my time spent there with you wasn't a waste. It, uh, it didn't fail. It, it, was, uh, it was successful. And it was based upon really what happened in the previous city that he started a church in, the city of Philippi. And uh, he wrote a letter to them called uh, Philippians. But he even mentions the difficulty that he suffered there in, uh, in the city of Philippi. He says this, verse 1, For you yourselves, brethren, know that our entrance in unto you was not in vain. It wasn't futile. It wasn't a waste of time. It wasn't a failure. But even after we had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. And so he, he speaks about what happened there in, in the, the suffering that he had in that city of Philippi, but how that he, he simply moved forward in ministry anyway. How do you do that? How do you suffer? You remember what happened to him? Him and his partner, Silas, uh, they were arrested for preaching the gospel, for casting a demon out of a, a fortune teller. Watch those fortune tellers, where they get their powers from. Cast a demon out of that uh, fortune telling young woman. And as a result, they were arrested. They were beaten. They were thrown into a, an ugly, damp, dark, underground dungeon called a prison. They were put in stocks. Their feet were put in stocks, so they were uncomfortable and painful and unable to move. This is what he's talking about here when he says how we were, we suffered and were shamefully entreated there. But yet they move forward despite that. You know how you do that? Only one way. You do it by the grace of God. It was only God's strength that enabled them to have the courage to go to the next town knowing we may suffer similar things there. But God gave them the courage. The Holy Spirit gave them boldness despite the greatness of their opposition because they were not there for themselves. They were there for the Lord and for those people. And that's what drove these men like Paul. He had a successful ministry. He begins by saying that in verse 1. You know, that's what every church planter and every pastor wants is a successful ministry, like Paul mentions he had there. And the chapter really, if you summarize this second chapter of 1 Thessalonians. I think what it comes down to is it is a great picture of a pastor's unselfish heart. That's who Paul is, and that's what he describes here. There is a desire, and there is a willingness on this pastor's part, Paul, to spend whatever he needs to spend to be spent himself. Not only to spend his own money, but to be spent himself, his strength, his vigor, in order to have ministry with these people, in order to minister to this congregation. And so the first 16 verses, he talks about his relations with them. And in the last three verses, 17 through 20, he talks about 
his separation from them, his relations with them, his separation from them. We want to look at it that way from a pastor's viewpoint, Pastor Paul, after we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the heart of Paul. It certainly was a heart like yours. He was a man after God's own heart. And Lord, that's what we should be. We should be people after God's own heart too. We should have this kind of an attitude and we should have this kind of ministry with one another because it's not just the pastor. We should be assembling together like we're doing this morning, like we're doing this afternoon, like we're doing today. We should be gathering together in order to encourage one another, in order to exhort and encourage one another and to stir up in each other greater love for you and greater love for our brothers and sisters. Lord, cause our love for you to be supreme and cause our love for each other to increase and abound more and more. And then, Lord, uh, we meet together to stir up one another to serve you faithfully and to trust you to be fruitful in our serving. And we just thank you for, again, the example of this man of God. And Lord, make us to be followers of his example in this way. And we just thank you for what you're going to do, how you're going to speak individually to our hearts as we look at this passage this morning. And it's all to the glory of Jesus because he is the one and only worthy. And so we look to him to have the preeminence. And we thank you, Spirit of God, for your working through us and uh, speaking to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look at the relations that he has with his church. Remember, he was only there a few months. In fact, when you read the background of Paul's time in uh, Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17, he simply says that he was in the synagogue to begin with for uh, three Sabbaths, I think it is. So about a month. We surmise, again, we don't know for sure, that after he had to leave the synagogue after three Sabbaths, after three weeks, that he probably had ministry there in the city in some other venue, perhaps the, the house that he was staying in. Uh, I think, uh, if I can recall correctly, the house of justice. He's staying in this, in this home, and perhaps he ministered in the city for several more months out of that home that he is residing in. We know that he worked there. He tells us in this chapter that he supported himself uh, financially while he was there, so he wouldn't be a burden to that uh, that new congregation. But uh, so he stayed a month in the synagogue, perhaps, roughly, and a few more months he ministered in that city outside of the synagogue. We don't know. Uh, I'm sure that maybe three, four, at the most, six months he spent in this city. And so this is significant. What he says about his relations with these people after only ministering to them for a few months, what kind of relationships did he establish with them uh, between him and the church? What, what were they like? Well, he makes it very clear when you read the chapter, you know what? I ministered among you and I wanted nothing from you for myself. I wanted nothing for myself, rather, I was willing to spend and be spent caring for you. And there are five characteristics that jump out at us in this passage of how Paul shows that he was willing to spend and be spent in order to have ministry among these people. And the first one is in verses three through six. And, I, and then I jump down to nine and 10 because they're clumped together. And I say, his ministry among them, his relations with them is, first of all, he is doing what he is doing very sincerely. That's the first thing that characterizes 
this pastor's heart and his ministry among them. He's doing what he's doing very sincerely. Look at what he says in verse 3. Uh, for our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness. That's sexual impurity. Nor in guile. And uh, uh, guile, of course, carries with it the idea also of uh, deceitfulness, underhanded methodology. Verse 4, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. And when we preach the gospel, we didn't do it to please men, but God, because God's the one that he tests our hearts. He tests our inner man. And he goes on to say in verse 5, for neither at any time used we flattering words. We didn't try to please men. We didn't try to flatter people, as you know. Nor did we minister among you with a cloak of covetousness. A cloak of covetousness is referring to greed. I did not minister to you for what I could personally get out of it. I didn't do it for personal advantage. I'm willing to spend my own money and spend my, my energy in order to preach the gospel to you, he says. And then he also mentions in verse 6, nor of men sought we glory. We didn't want your pat on the back. We're not looking for your applause. He said, neither of you nor yet of others when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, we could have expected you to financially support us, but instead, we pat our own way. In fact, look at verses 9 and 10. For remember, brethren, our labor and travail among you. You know what labor and travail is, uh, mothers? <laughs> Had children, you know what labor and travail is, and this is how he describes his ministry among them, like childbearing. My labor, travail, for laboring, notice this, night and day. Doesn't seem like he got a whole lot of sleep while he was ministering there in Thessalonica. Because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. In other words, he was paying his way financially. He was preaching during the day, and perhaps after he was done preaching, he would then go to, he was a tent maker, a, a leather worker, a craftsman of some type. And so he was, uh, he was doing that to pay the bill, so to speak, to take care of his own needs, is what he's talking about in verse 9 as he preached the gospel of God. Verse 10, you're witnesses, and God also is a witness. How holy, that is, how uh, separated unto God, and how justly, how rightly, and how unblameably, without reproach, we behaved ourselves among you that are believers. So Paul's ministry is characterized by the fact that he ministered sincerely. You know, there's always been a lot of fakes in Christian ministry. In fact, I'm reminded that when I planted the church in Connecticut, I remember we no sooner got there and uh, started to have our first service, and it came out in the headlines of the local newspaper that some church planter, not me, some church planter had come and started a church, and uh, he had been there just a short while, and he took the people's money and he ran. Not good press for us as we're starting out. There's always been a lot of fakes in the Christian world. But Paul says, look, our ministry to you is without any hidden agenda. In fact, it's very, it's been very costly to me in terms of suffering to bring this message. We came from suffering in Philippi to bring this message to you. You know what? Persecution really clears the deck, so to speak. By that, I mean, it purges and it purifies your inner motives when you have to suffer, when it costs you 
to minister the word of God, it really is a purifying, has a purifying effect. It eliminates trying to deceive and defraud people and to use people for your own personal gain, selfish gain. Paul is saying, and this is the this is the pattern of biblical ministry. Biblical ministry is this. We don't serve in order to get. We serve in order to give. And that's him. Despite the cost to you personally, you don't want to be a burden to people. You want to be a blessing to people is what he's saying. And the only approval that you're interested in seeking is God's approval. It's nice to know you're appreciated, but what's important is God pleased with my ministry? Is God pleased with my life? That's the thing that Paul says really counts. And so he earned and spent his own money in order to minister. And as a result, in verse 10, he says, I've been devoted, I've been honest, and I have lived a faultless life toward you. So in relations with this church, Paul says, I have ministered sincerely. But look at verses 7 and 8. Here's another characteristic of his relations with these people. He says, we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, listen to this, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us kind of relations that he had with his church. Not only were that he was ministering sincerely, but he was ministering maternally. You know that term maternal? Mothering? That's what he's picturing his ministry. In those seventh and eight verses, he's saying, my ministry among you was like a, a caring, nursing mother. There's probably... No greater picture of tenderness and uh, nurturing and cherishing than a nursing mother. He said, that's the kind of ministry I had among you. You know, some of the, 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 uh, the most special and strongest bonds in human life develop between a mother and her nursing infant. And that's what Paul is saying. That's what I was like among you. That's the kind of a bond I developed with you. And as verse 8 says, a nursing mother, I mean, if you're in a third world country and you're starving to death and you have an infant that's nursing, you'll let them suck the, the, the last stitch of life out of you in order to have your baby survive even if it means you die. And that's what he's saying here in that eighth verse. We not only imparted unto you the gospel, but our own souls, because you were dear unto us like an infant child is dear to a, a nursing mom. We've, we've been willing to give our very life like a, like a mother for you. Suffering in order to teach you the word of God. An unusual, unselfish, caring that Paul is expressing for the, the brethren there in this church. He, his ministry was one of really being maternally. But look at this. Go down to verse 11 and 12. As you know, we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Yet you'd walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. His ministry was not only sincerely and maternally, but fatherly as well. He treated these people with special care as a wise father that gives gentle but loving instruction and advice, who tenderly pleads with his children who ministers 
to them as a father ministers to his family. You know, I was thinking about this. He's talking about a deep spiritual connection here. My spirit is joined to Christ. I'm a believer. And as believers, if you're believers, your spirit is joined to Christ. Well, because our spirits are joined to Christ, our spirits are joined to one another because we're all in Christ. And so we're joined human spirit as a pastor to the spirits of God's people. That is, that's a, a mystical and uh, that is a special bond that no other human being has. Believers join to the spirit of Christ and join spirit to spirit to one another as a result. There's something mystic about that. There, there's something deep about that. And there's something special about that that I can't even verbalize. We are, I'm telling you, I've said this before, we are closer than any physical family is. As much as we, look, if your family members are believers, then you have a double bond, right? You're, you're bond physically with them, biologically with them, but if they are also believers, then you have that second bond and probably deeper bond of spirit to spirit. Human spirit to human spirit. This is why it's so important that husbands and wives are both believers. I mean, genuinely born again. And if you are here and you are not born again, and perhaps your spouse is, you need to be born again today. You need to have your spirit joined to your spouse. And children need to have their be born again so that their spirits can be joined to their parents. And joined to Christ, where the pastor's human spirit is joined to the people's human spirit. That's incredible when I thought about that. But that's what's behind this motherly and this fatherly kind of ministry that, that he's characterized by. And then the fifth characteristic of Paul's ministry there in uh, Thessal, uh, Thessalonica. I'm dropping down to verse 13 through verse 16. He says, for this cause, we thank God. His ministry is also characterized as one that uh, he has thankfully. He has a constant gratitude to God about the ministry of the word there. Notice he says, we thank God without ceasing because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you didn't receive it as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. That kind of reminds me of what he said in his opening introduction in chapter 1 and verse 5. Our gospel, the word of God, came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. You know, the prayer of a genuine uh, pastor that preaches God's word to his people is exactly what Paul expresses there. It, it makes us so thankful in heart when we are certain that the ministry of the word is being received by the hearers in an anointed fashion that not only that the preacher is anointed, but that the people that listen are anointed so that you receive the message, not as the word of the pastor, but as it is in truth, the word of God, the word that the spirit of God has for you as an individual. That brings thankfulness to the heart of the pastor that not only is it accepted, when it's accepted, what it results in is it becomes applied. You know, I think we would, I, I'm not against, don't misunderstand me, I'm not against Christian counseling, but I think we could get rid of a lot of Christian counseling if people would just accept the word of God as it is in truth when it's preached and then apply it to their life. 
and not simply be hearers of the word, but become doers of the word. And it would, uh, it would eliminate a lot of personal and uh, family problems. And this is what made him thankful when people accepted and applied the word of God to their lives. And look at what he says in verse 14, for ye brethren became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. And then he talks about how the churches in Judea suffered from their own countrymen, from their own Jewish uh, kinsmen. They killed the Lord Jesus. They killed some of their own prophets. And he said, and they persecuted us. I can identify what you're going through because I've suffered the same things from my countrymen that you're suffering from your countrymen. And I think what he's saying is, is, uh, you know, let's, I'm treating you people as brethren. He calls them brethren over and over again, right? I'm treating you as equals. Uh, I'm suffering what you're suffering. You're suffering what I'm suffering. And uh, yet God's continuing to work in you despite even through suffering, the persecution that you're suffering for the faith. God's not hindered by that. And so Paul's encouraged. He's thankful. He shares in their persecution in his way. And uh, he basically is saying, look, I genuinely feel your pain. Now, that's, that's a trite saying, and people say that, and they don't really mean it. In fact, it's a way for them to really... Uh, um, make fun of you. Oh, I feel your pain. Yeah, sure. Well, what are you doing about it? <laughs> right? So, but Paul is saying here, I truly feel your pain because I'm suffering the same pain. I'm undergoing persecution too. Do you ever stop to feel the pain of brethren that are suffering persecution because they're believers? I mean, you may not even know them, but do you read about them? And do you think about them? And do you pray for them? You know, we're really supposed to do that. In fact, I, I think about how, uh, I don't know who wrote, we're not sure who wrote the book of Hebrews uh, specifically, but he says this, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them and them that suffer adversity as being yourselves in the body. What he's saying is, put yourself in the place of your brothers and sisters that are suffering persecution because they are believers in Jesus. And feel their pain. <laughs> because, again, our spirit is joined with their spirit, whether we know them personally or not. We're joined. We're one family in the Lord. And that's why Paul says when one part of the body of Christ suffers, the whole body suffers. Now, this is what he's saying to them. We're equals here. And he's encouraging them. He's thankful for them. Okay, that's the relations that he had with the church in Thessalonica. And now he kind of laments, beginning in verse 17 of chapter 2. He laments separation from them. Here's what he says. Remember, he's in the city of Corinth now, having had to leave uh, Thessalonica. He's in Corinth. He's writing this letter to them uh, shortly after having been there. And he says this in verse 70, we brethren being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great, we wanted to come back again. Verse 18, wherefore we, we would have come unto you again. I, Paul, I would have come more than once. I would have come again and again, but Satan hindered us. Satan hindered us. You know, physical separation is like, the way he puts it, like being under attack, like being persecuted by your own countrymen. But he says, we're never separated spiritually. We're never separated in the spirit. Remember I said that your human spirit and uh, and uh, the other believers, human spirits, they're joined together. You can't ever break that bond, okay? 
we're we're together spiritually, but physical separation is something that is difficult, and Paul is feeling it there. But he says, you're always in my heart. And obviously, they're always in his prayers as well. Um, as a result of me doing this uh, four days a week uh, job in the mornings, I'm not able to go to a pastor's prayer time that meets the first Monday of every month. And uh, as a result, you know, I, I really miss being there and uh, praying with these men. And uh, I handed it off to a pastor friend of mine to, uh, to uh, facilitate it. And uh, he sends out an, an email like I used to, to remind the guys of the prayer times. And I got the email just this week and I, I responded and I said, you know, I'm really uh, sorry that I can't join you men. And uh, I miss it but I'm there in spirit. And that's what uh, Paul wants us to know. Separations physically as brethren in the Lord, they can be painful, but we're never separated in spirit. He says in that, uh, in that verse, I'm still with you. In verse 17, I'm not with you physically, but I'm with you in heart. I'm with you in spirit, if you will. There's a longing in those two verses that we've just read. There's a longing. There is an intense desire on Paul's part to return to this church, to see this flock once again with his own two eyes. And he actually tried, he said, on more than one occasion, but Satan always hindered me from doing this. I don't know what that means. I don't know how Satan hindered him, but we have to understand there are times when we want to do something and Satan stands in the way and he hinders us from doing something that perhaps uh, we would like to do. You say, well, where does God come into the picture here? Because I thought God was stronger than Satan. Well, he is. But God's put Satan on a, on a pretty long leash, I think. God's put Satan on a pretty long leash, and he gives him certain uh, ability and certain authority. But the fact of the matter is, you and I in Christ have authority over all of the unseen realm, meaning Satan and all of his hosts, according to what Paul himself teaches in the book of Ephesians. It's a wonderful thing. When we understand that, believe it, and exercise it, why didn't he overcome the the satanic hindrances at this point, I don't know. I don't have an answer because I don't even know what they were other than for some reason he wasn't able to make it. But he had a longing. The point is separation. He has a longing in his heart to be with God's people. You have that kind of longing in your heart? You know, my wife and I, whenever we're away from this congregation, we enjoy uh, fellowshipping uh, with other people in different places, but we have a, a there's a there's an understanding. We both have a longing in our heart to be back here, to be with you, uh, because we're joined in in spirit, as I said, and uh, it's our desire to be back. There's a longing here in verses 17 and 18, but would you look at verses 19 and 20, the last two verses in the chapter? There is a rewarding, there is a rewarding that he is referring to here. He says, what is our hope? Hope is something in the future. You know what biblical hope is? Biblical hope is a patient, confident waiting for something yet in the future. So what is Paul's confident, patient waiting for? What is our hope? What is our joy? What is our crown of rejoicing? A crown is a reward that God is going to give to his people for certain, uh, in certain areas of their life. We earn reward. It's gracious of God to enable us to earn reward, 
We don't do it in our self-effort. He gives us the strength to earn the reward. And then he gives us a reward for something that he gave us the strength to do. You know, it's like when we take an offering, I, I often say, look, you're you're giving back to the Lord what he first gave you. And isn't it humbling to think that God's willing to take from me what he gave me? And God's willing to reward believers for something that he gave us the ability to accomplish. And what is the, the crown of rejoicing? What is the reward here? Notice it, verse 19. You, the church, the believers that Paul ministered the word of God to, and it impacted them because they received it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God itself. They received it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he said, so you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming, that's my reward. That's reward enough for me. For you, verse 20, are our glory and our joy. The people that Paul ministered to, the people that Paul impact were the source of hope and joy at Jesus' return. They were his pride and joy, you might say. But I think they were already. <laughs> and I think God's people that are changed by the transforming power of the word of God are in the heart of a pastor, the greatest joy. Remember John? He says in his uh, second letter, I have no greater joy than to see that my people walk in truth. And so the reward is that there will be people that are people of God, that one day we will be together with the Lord. And it will be because of ministry that Paul said, I've had among you. The thing that was his pride and joy was the fact that this church had a genuine relationship with Jesus. You know, it's easy to play church. It's easy to show up when you're supposed to show up and say what you're supposed to say and do what you're supposed to do. But that's a big distance between being a genuine believer in Jesus. And I'm convinced, and I don't know, uh, always specifics, but I'm convinced that there are people that are very faithful and look like Christians, but they're not ever, they've never really been born again. And that's a warning, I think, to all of us. I'm not trying to make you doubt your salvation. I just want you to do what the scripture says to examine yourself and be sure that you're in the faith. There shouldn't be any doubt about that on your part or others. So what the pastor here wants to see more than anything is his own flock loving Jesus and loving Jesus till he comes. Because you know that every one of us who are pastors will one day stand before the Lord and give an account of our flock, will give an account of our ministry, and we'll either be rewarded with this crown of rejoicing or we'll lose that reward. Again, I was just a moment ago uh, looking in Hebrews chapter 13 and telling you what the Bible says about how we should remember people that are believers that are persecuted. In that same chapter, listen to this. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, and he's talking about spiritual leaders in the local church. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves to them, for they watch for your souls, as they must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that's unprofitable for you. So he, he's saying church leaders are going to stand before the Lord, and they're going to give an account for their flock. And uh, he says, it won't be to your advantage if when they have to give an account, they can't give a good one uh, concerning you, is what he's saying. 
And I think in, in light of that, in Revelation chapter 4, there's a wonderful picture. And it is really believers worshiping before the throne of Jesus. And it says that they have crowns on their heads. And I believe that that's maybe the crown of rejoicing is one of them. It's rewards that they have that they have uh, been rewarded by the grace of God. And you know what they do with those crowns on their heads? They take them off. And in an act of worship, they willingly cast them at the feet of Jesus. And they say, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive all honor and glory and power. For thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. And so it's an act of worship. We're casting our crowns, our rewards at Jesus' feet. When good and deep relationships exist between a pastor and his people, being apart is very difficult. You long to be together when you're away. What's a successful ministry, or a Christian life for that matter, what, is, what, what does that look like? I think we saw a picture of it here. But I want to read a couple of excerpts from some pastors that are long gone. One of them is Richard Baxter. He was a Puritan. He lived in the 1600s. Another one is Robert Murray McShane. He was a pastor in, in uh, Dundee, Scotland, back in the 1800s. I want, to, I want to quote from them. Listen to what he says. This is Baxter. He says, it is an obvious error for all to see in those ministers of the church who make such a wide gulf between their preaching and their living. They will study hard to preach exactly, and yet study little or not at all to live exactly. All week long is little enough to study how to speak for two hours, and yet one hour seems to be too much time to study how to live all the week. They hate to misplace a word in their sermons, and yet they think nothing of misplacing their desires, their words, and their actions in the course of their lives. How strange I have heard some men preach, and how carelessly I have seen them live. That's Baxter. Here's what McShane says. He's writing to a friend who has just been ordained uh, into ministry as a pastor. And he says, in great measure, according to the purity and the completeness of the instrument, he's talking about the, the pastor as being an instrument of God, according to the purity and the completion of the instrument will be the success. Now listen to this. McShane said this. It's not great talents that God blesses, so much as great likeness to Jesus. A holy pastor is a powerful weapon in the hand of God. You know what your number one ministry is, if you have it? If you serve the Lord at all, you know what your number one ministry is? Your number one ministry is to seek the Lord with all of your heart and worship him. You can't you can't minister to anyone until you have first ministered to the Lord and allowed him to minister to your own heart. I've taken, I don't know if I would call it a life verse, but it's my life. It's This verse is my mission statement, if I could put it that way. And it's simply this. Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Death to self, so that the power, the powerful resurrection life of Christ that is in me can flow through me.